Hi, I'm Janice Johnson. I volunteer in the Oakwood Children's Ministry for two reasons. Uh, first, it just makes sense to me. Um, Monday through Friday, I work in the business world, and in business, you look to invest your assets where you feel like you get the greatest return on investment. And in terms of when people are reached with the gospel message of Jesus, and if those people actually accept Christ, the greatest number of people are reached as a child. So to me, you get the greatest return on investment with children, so why wouldn't I invest my time and energy serving with the children? The second reason is I am selfish. And I get such a blessing out of working with the kids and serving in the ministry. And to sit and watch someone make the profession of faith and be baptized and know that that was a child that was in my Sunday school class or in my color group. That's priceless to feel like that. God might have used me in some small way. You just, it just doesn't get any better than that. And that's why I serve. Amen. Yeah, Janice said yes years ago, and God has used her in, in some amazing ways, and I hope that's an encouragement to you this morning, because today we're going to be talking about really what she represents, which is the heart, the heart of those who serve, the heart of those who uh, serve and worship Jesus and are part of His mission. So uh, welcome to Say Yes, part three. If you haven't been here the first couple of weeks, give you a quick uh, recap. The first week we uh, talked about Ephesians 4 and how uh, God's plan for ministry is that it said there literally that Jesus is the head of the body and that we are all called in different roles to be a part of that body. And when that body is fully functioning and healthy and every member of that body is doing their part in ministry, it grows. It grows spiritually. It grows in depth. It also grows numerically. More and more people come to the Lord Jesus Christ and it's just an awesome thing. And so that is God's plan for his church is that we'd all be active members. We'd all be serving the ministry and doing our functioning part as the body of Christ Jesus. And then last week we talked about uh, the faith part of this, right? Because it's a little risky. Some of us are like, oh man, this is going to be a really big risk for me to step out and to serve in this area. And yes, and in faith we do that, in faith in the calling of God. We talked last week about Noah uh, building this ark for many, many years and, and what he had to endure in faith. Uh, we also talked about Abraham in faith serving the Lord. Um, just awesome, awesome uh, men of the, of the scriptures that we study and we look at and we can learn and be motivated by their faith. And today we're going to be talking about the, the heart. We invite you to follow along this morning. You can either follow along in your Bible. Uh, you can also uh, follow along in the app. Uh, if you have your phone or your tablet with you, uh, just log into the uh, Oakwood app there. Go to sermon notes and all the scriptures and all the bullet points and all that will be there for you this morning. Now I brought a friend of mine uh, a picture this morning, so I'd like to put that up if we can. This, this is Yvonne, and Yvonne was a volunteer at Vacation Bible School. You can see her in her Joy Story uh, a t-shirt, and she's got, got her badge there. She's with some of our friends like Buzz and, and Woody and, and with one of our uh, uh, VBS kids. But I, I wanted to just point out, because last week I talked about how uh, sometimes we make excuses, and some people are like, well, I'm retired, and so because I'm retired, I've retired from the Lord. Um, and Yvonne, she's actually 84 years young. And uh, she served at VBS all week. In fact, I remember one night, uh, it was about 30 minutes before vacation Bible school. Yeah, give a hand of applause for that. <clears throat> and by the way, I, I don't even know if she's here this morning, but I didn't ask her if I could do this. So I hope you still love me, Yvonne. But I remember one night, it was about... It was about 20 minutes before it started, so early, earlier than 6 when it, when it all kicks off, I was walking over to the gym uh, through the office area, through the gap over here, and I remember noticing her there, and she was helping other volunteers get their name badges on and sign in and, and get, get their names on their badges and stuff, and then I remember about two and a half hours later, I'm walking back by, and she's still standing there, and I'm thinking in my head, Yvonne, you're 84, find a chair, you know? I mean, I don't know if she stood the whole time, but, you know, and I know some of you may say, well, I can't physically do it like like Yvonne. Yvonne's just in great shape, you know. She's been doing those buns of steel videos for a millennia, and it's just really paid off. And so she could, no, I'm telling you what, it's her heart. It's her heart. It's Janice in the video. 
It's her heart. It's her heart that motivates them. It's her heart that keeps them going because they said, I want to be a part of what God is doing in this church. And, and I may be the 84-year-old part, but I'm telling you what, I'm going to do my part. And that's what we're calling you to in this series is to say yes. And let's dive into it this morning to learn more about this. This is going to be a familiar passage this morning from Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, if you're following along in your Bible, if you're following along with one of ours that's provided for you this morning, just turn that Bible to page 868. 868, you'll be right where we need to be this morning. Luke chapter 10, we're going to begin there with verse 30. A little bit of background here. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. Some of you may ring that bell. Oh yeah, I've heard this story or I remember this story from a long time ago. Great, great story in Scripture. So much we could could learn from this story today. A little bit of background is is one of the the lawyer types comes to kind of trap Jesus in his words. And he comes to him and says, hey, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And and, and, uh, Jesus says, what do you you think you need to do? And the man answers back, well, I know the Scripture. Scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, hey, that's, that's a good answer. You're right. You know, you need to love God and have him be first and best and most and highest in your life. And then out of that love for God comes this love for another person and this heart of serving another. And, and so, yeah, love Lord your God, love your neighbor. And so then he goes, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers him this way, Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 30. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's several miles. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Let's pause there for a second. Let's understand what we're reading. And really think about this for a moment. Let's, let's put it into contemporary terms, okay? Somebody was coming from Wacomus to Enid. Okay, the suburbs, you know, Wacomas. Wacomas, they're coming from Wacomas to Enid, and they're poor. They don't have a vehicle, so they're walking along the side of the road. And all of a sudden, this car pulls up and pulls out in front of them, and they, they beat this guy, and anything he's got on his back or his bag or anything in his hands, they take from him, they steal from him, they rob him, and they leave him half dead. I mean, he's just there on the side of the road, okay? And then look what happens in our story, verse 31. It says, now by chance, just by chance, there was a priest that was going down the road. Hallelujah, right? He's like, somebody that's going to care about this guy. And it says, so the priest was, was, was coming down the road. And when he saw him laying on the side of the road, bleeding, beat up and everything, oh, he passed by on the other side. Hmm, okay, not representing well there. Oh, maybe this next one in verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, special tribe uh, of God in the people of Israel, um, special select people, religious types. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Man, we're 0 for 2. And then it says in verse 33, but a Samaritan. And what's significant about this, and I could probably talk about this for 15 minutes, but uh, is a Samaritan, the best way to describe them is they were kind of half-bred Jews. Um, it was very frustrating to the Jews to have them around because it's like they weren't all in and they had, had some different rules. They were obeying God in some areas, but not in all areas. And they had, had married interracially with other races that God had asked them not to. And so um, it's kind of like they're, they're there with them, but they're, they're from a different region. And, and it, just, it was just one of those people just annoying, you know. Um, you know, for us, you know, maybe if you're big Oklahoma and born and bred in Oklahoma, you know, somebody from Texas, you know. He's like, she comes in, and so, now we love our Texas people, but, but you know what I mean? It's kind of rivalry a little bit there. Okay, so that, that person, okay, they, they're kind of seen as an affront and as an offense. So the priest says no, the Levite says no, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, wasn't his plan, just on a journey, came to where he was, and pay attention as we read 33 and 34 here to all the action words here. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, He had compassion. He went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, that sounds a little weird. Why would you put oil and wine on a guy that's, you know, bleeding outside the road? It worked as a disinfectant. So he goes to him, and he pours out oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal. In the NIV, it says that it was a donkey. Set him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So he gives them kind of just this open bill. Charge it to my account. I'll take care of it 
when I'm coming back through this way. Because remember, he was on a journey. Verse 36, which of these three do you think, Mr. Lawyer, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell to the robbers? And verse 37, it says that he answered, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And look what Jesus said, go and do. Go and do. I wonder, as Christians, if we maybe just pause right there and say, oh, if we would just go and do. <laughs> just, just go and do what we know we're supposed to be doing. Go and do likewise. You mean when I'm on my journey, as I go along my way in life, that I need to serve another when I see needs? That I need to actually stop what I'm doing and consider? Yes. We need to say yes to these circumstances. And notice that it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the thing I want us to get this morning, is that serving is love's response. Serving is love's response. You could say it another way. You could also say that serving is compassion's response. Because notice that there in the scripture, in verse 33, 33 it says, but the Samaritan had compassion on this man when he saw that he was hurt, that he was wounded, and that he had needs. Because I would venture and go as far as saying this, if you do not serve, do you really love? If you choose not to serve, do you really love? Because we're called to love God. We're called to love his mission. We're called to, to love his kingdom. And we're called to serve it. To serve in it and to support it and to be involved in it. Why? Because we love God and we love his kingdom and we love what he is about. Now, now this morning you may say, well, that's not true. Let me give you a couple examples that might, might paint the picture and bring this into a frame of reference for you. Let's say this morning that you love bowling. All right? And so if you came out, man, I love bowling. And I'd say, hey, so tell me about bowling. Dude, bowling is awesome, okay? Bowling, I have my own ball, okay? Costs like $200. And I shine this ball, you know? I mean, it's got this waxy, oily thing, and I got the special cloth and no fingerprints on it, you know? And I go to the lanes, and I pay my three or four bucks every time, and I bowl that ball down the lane. And I try to get better at hitting the pins and the scoring thing and the screens with the little, you know, emojis on the screens. I'm into all that. And I've got gear. I've got, I've geared up. I've got this wrist Velcro thing that I put on. I, I've, I've got the shoes, you know, and I've got my own shoes. I don't wear the stinky ones everybody else wears. No, I got my own set of shoes. And I say, oh, so you're, you love bowling. Oh, I love bowling. Are you involved in bowling? I am involved in bowling. Do you serve bowling? I serve bowling. I love bowling. And you're involved there. Why? Because you love it. You really love it. You're passionate about it. You find encouragement in it even. Bowling. Some of you may not be bowling. Man, maybe that was a silly example. Maybe it's motorcycles. Hey, yeah, man, I'm into motor. I'll tell you what, I polish my cycle every week, and I make sure the spark plugs are good on it, and I've, I, I, you know, I put a little wax job on the gas tank there. It's so pretty, and you know, I got my tailpipes all ready to roll, you know, and I've got my seat, and I don't ever leave it in the sun because I don't want any cracks in my seat, and, and, and you know, I put fuel in it, and I study it online. I'm always upgrading every year, and I just, I'm into motorcycles, and I'm not so into motorcycles. I, I serve them by riding. I ride all the time. I take it over here, take it over there, and we go on these, these rides with the church, you know, even some church people on their motorcycles. And, and I've got friends that are in motorcycles, and I love motorcycles. Are you involved in motorcycles? Well, of course. If you see, I've got like seven helmets. I mean, yes, I love motorcycles. Motorcycles wear it out because I love them. Are you involved? Are you serving somewhere with motorcycles? Yeah. Do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. Do you love his kingdom? Yes, I love his kingdom. Do you love his church? I love the church. I love all the people in the church. Well, are you involved in serving in the church? No. <laughs> I, I uh, watch sermons and I uh, sing songs. Sometimes I don't sing. Sometimes I'm just there, arms crossed. But, you know, I'm there. I, I mean, I attend. I attend. But are you involved? Are you serving? Are you sacrificing for that? Because you love Jesus and you love his mission. You know that he died. You don't want him to die in vain. You want everybody to know. And so do you serve? I'm not really involved in it. Would you sacrifice for it? You sacrifice all this money for your cycle, for your bowling habit, and your, your bowling league? Nah. You see where I'm going? 
But if we say we love something, then serving it is love's response. Now, in our passage this morning, I think there's three things that, that we learn here. And a reminder that the Great Commission calls us to love people who we don't know, love people who are far from God, love people that we're uncomfortable with. That's just what the Great Commission is. But what specifically did this Samaritan-type person do? I want to share three, three thoughts with you this morning. The first one is this. And actually, does anyone remember when you were in elementary school and we did, you know, fire drills and, you know, security drills and tornado drills. Do you remember fire drills, what they would tell you if you ever caught on fire, like your shirt got fire on it? What were you supposed to do? Ah, oh, everybody still remembers it. Stop, drop, and roll. That, that's the points of the sermon today. Real easy to remember. Stop, drop, and roll. The first one, stop. How did the Samaritan stop? He was going on a journey. He saw the need. And by the way, just so everybody knows, there's a wall of needs out there. Okay, I'm just saying. Shameless plug. But anyway, but he stopped at the say yes wall, <laughs> at the man on the side of the road in the ditch, and he paused and he took a moment to decide what his response was going to be. And so many times I think we have excuses, right, of why we won't stop. It's like, well, hey, you know, I'm going to serve someday when I quit this. When this is over, and I would encourage you this morning, quit the quits and quit the overs. And I would even say quit the wins, quit the wins. Well, when this is over, then I'll serve. Or when this part of my life, when I'm in an empty nester mode, then I'll serve God. Or when I'm this, and everybody's got all these excuses about when and, and after this. And it's like, just, just stop now. Just stop now and say yes and serve. Because there should be this urgency to our mission. Because the Bible says that Jesus is coming again soon, that no one knows the day or the hour, but there are signs. And if you read the signs in the Bible, you're like, whoa, this is, this is happening sooner rather than later. Every day, it seems like we're a step closer to the soon return of Jesus Christ. And so there ought to be this sense of urgency to our mission. There ought to be the sense of urgency to doing what we're called to do. Because here's, here's a fact this morning. I think everybody can relate to this. We don't want to get caught up and not serving. Like, what would it be like if Jesus came back, like, right now? Jesus comes back, the trumpet sounds, Jesus comes, comes in, and, and what, we, what are you going to say? Like, you want to be doing the Lord's work, right? It's, if Jesus comes and you know you're supposed to be doing something for the kingdom of God, he says, hey, it's so good to see you, and, and I'm here, and so tell me, what have you, you been doing lately? When I was going to quit that, when, when this season was over, then I was going to, well, what about that? Well, when I quit doing that, then, then, and Lord, I was going to give you some time, maximum time and effort. I promise you're going to be the main thing after that. And, you know, that's really awkward. Now, let me put this, let me put it to you in a different way this morning that maybe everyone can relate to. It's kind of like if you're a kid, teenagers, you'll be able to, to relate to this. Kids, if any kids in the service, you'll be able to relate to this. When you're a kid and your parents leave the house to go run an errand, what do parents always do? Go leave you a list, right? All right, now, mom and I are going to go run an errand, okay? And here's the deal. I need you to finish cleaning the kitchen. I need you to finish at least one of your two subjects of homework, and I want you to take out the trash. And I want that done before we get back, okay? So mom and dad leave, the garage door goes down, you're like, freedom! You get on your phone, you're like, hey, gonna watch the YouTube, gonna watch some of those uh, bloggers here, video bloggers, and you, you know, you get distracted, you know, maybe you're playing some video game, you're on the computer, you just kind of get distracted, and then it happens, right? You're sitting there minding your own business, and you hear the garage door. <laughs> and it vibrates the whole house. <laughs> It's like the second coming of the parents now, you know? <laughs> and you know, it runs back in your mind, right? You're like, oh no, wait, I was supposed to, oh, trash, trash. And you run over the trash and you just like take the whole can out, right? <laughs> you, you don't even line it, just the can is gone. You know, the dishes, you're throwing them in the dishwasher, you're shutting the door, you're hoping that no one will see it, you know? And, and mom, you know, what have you been doing? Oh yeah, I've been working on dishes and trash and got one of my subjects and homework done because I know mom and dad aren't going to check it anyway. And so, yeah, is it, you know, 
It's kind of like that. It's that awkward moment, right? Sometimes this happens to us as, as adults too, okay? Right? Husbands, mom leaves. Honey, can, can you make sure the girls get their homework done? Can you make sure they put the, the clothes away? All the clothes that I've folded for three weeks that are all over the couches and the living room and everywhere. And then can you have, you know, one of them or you, can you make sure that the living room gets vacuumed? And, and I'll, I'll be home, just going to run a couple errands. And guys, we get, you know, the garage door goes down. We're like, whew. It's like, hey, dude, I'm just going to take five minutes, just five. I'm going to sit in my chair. I'm going to put my feet up and turn on a little ESPN. I'm going to check out what's going on with the Chiefs because they're good now. So every day ESPN is about the Chiefs. And so it's like, man, I'm going to watch a little bit of Chiefs here. This is going to be a this is going to be really, really good. I, I, I love this. And, and you don't want to get caught doing nothing, right? That's the whole purpose. And you've had these assignments. And then, just like with your kids, what? A garage door goes up. <laughs> and you're thinking, man, what was I supposed to Oh, there's clothes everywhere. Girls, girls, get your clothes. Come get all the clothes. Put them in your rooms. I don't care where you put them. Just put them out of sight. Throw them all in your closet. <laughs> I want moms to think we've been working hard this whole time that she's... She's been gone, and, 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 you know, whatever the little assignments and everything are, you're just sitting there the whole time because, you know, and what do you do? You, like, get up out of the chair. You've been in the chair the whole time. You just get up out of the chair. You act like, man, I'm busy working and sweating, spraining yourself. Like, man, I've just been <laughs> working hard this whole time. Oh, honey, man, I've just been, man, we've gotten everything done that you wanted to get done and accomplished. Uh, me and the girls, we've been working hard this whole time. You know, it's that embarrassment, right? When that garage door goes up, you're like, man. This is not good. In all seriousness, though, what would it be like if the Son of God were to come back? And you're like, man, I knew he'd give me an assignment. I knew I was supposed to be doing, but I wasn't doing it. And part of it is that we have to acknowledge it. We have to see it. We have to stop. Stop going through the motions of life. Stop hurting yourself. Stop going on to the next thing. Stop and really notice what's going on around you. And notice that God might be calling you to step up and to say yes, but we have to stop. The second thing is that we need to drop. We need to drop because this is what the Samaritan did. It actually says that he dropped down to help. He was on some type of an animal. The NIV tells us it was a donkey. Um, and and the, the, when he was going along his way, he humbled himself by getting off his high horse, is maybe a term you've heard before, and by serving in humility, by making himself nothing. You know, and I love it when people will take a humble position and serving. Uh, two weeks ago, the first week we signed up out Say Yes, I was just walking out there kind of mingling a little bit, and I overheard a conversation with uh, one of our volunteers that was helping people sign up with a lady that was like, just put me in a place that, that no one else wants. Put me in a place that's behind the scenes. I don't need any recognition. I just want, I just want to fill that spot that no one else wants. I'll be that part. And I was like, wow, how cool is that? Because sometimes we'd be selfish with our serve, right? Like, I'm going to be selfish, I'm going to be, I only do this, I only do this. And, and some of us, when we step up to serve, we, you know, we want the place of notoriety, we want the place that's up front, in front of people and all this kind of stuff. And yet we're called to humble service. And sometimes we need to drop down a bit. We need to pick a ministry where we can involve ourselves fully that's actually going to cost us something. And we become fully engaged in it, and we want to give it our all. And some of us, we just need to get off our donkey, right? And just be glad I didn't use the King James this morning, because it uses a different word. That would be really awkward. But we need to get off our donkey, and we're called to do. Look what he did here. It says, as he journeyed, he came to where he was. He saw him. He had compassion. Then he went to him. He got off the donkey. He bound up his wounds. He poured oil and wine. Then he set him up on his donkey and let him ride all the way to the inn. He brought him to the inn, and it says he took care of him. He just served this man. He doesn't even know him. But he's like, you know what? I'm going to do something. I'm going to drop down. I'm going to stop. And I'm going to drop, and I'm going to engage in, in loving my neighbor in humility. I'm going to stop. I'm going to drop. And the third thing is 
that I'm going to roll. I'm going to roll. I'm going to roll in some time. This is going to take some time. He's not going to heal like in an hour. We're going to have to be engaged longer than that in this kind of ministry service. And the other thing is that uh, he's going to need some resources. I'm going to have to roll in some time, but I'm also going to have to roll in some resources. In fact, I might have to sacrifice something. I might need to be willing to sacrifice. I want to encourage you, as so many do in our church, is to work hard in the area of ministry that God has you. To work hard there, to sacrifice there. To, to understand that a ministry that costs nothing usually accomplishes nothing. There might be a cost to this. We kind of talked about this last week, that there's going to be this cost to us. And then we're going to have to roll in our time. We're going to have to roll in our resources. We're going to actually, actually have to step it up a notch. We may actually have to sacrifice other time. I'll give you an example for me, and I'm not trying to like brag or toot my horn or anything like that, but I love football, and I love Kansas City Chiefs, and I want to watch them every week. I hardly ever watch them live. I record it. Sometimes I don't watch it till Monday. So don't be one of those guys that texts me the score at 3 p.m. or 7 p.m., I mean, one of our elders is really bad about it. It's like, did you see what Tyreek Hill just did? I'm like, no, I ain't going to see it till tomorrow, so leave it alone. I mean, because I'm doing ministry, and I have other things and other priorities going on, and I will get to the game later. I'll get to my, my activity and my fun thing later, because right now I want to be focused on the Lord. I want to make sure that these things are done, and it's a priority in my life. And some of you are going to feel that same way, and it's not going to be watching a football game. I know that seems so trivial, not important, right? But to some of you, it's a call to sacrifice. It's a call to roll in resources here and roll in time here. And you may have to take that time away from something else. You may have to take that time away from something that you love for something that you love more. And you're going to roll in those times. You're going to roll in those resources. And so we're called to stop. We're called to drop. And we're called to roll. And I wonder sometimes when we don't do these things, how many blown opportunities for ministry and service are there? And then it really makes me begin to question, what is the baseline problem? Why am I not more excited or more involved in ministry and in serving in my church? And I think the core of the problem is our hearts. It's our hearts. And we have to ask ourselves, do we really love Jesus? Or do we just love what Jesus did for us? Do we really love God and love his mission and love his plan to redeem the world through the sacrifice of his one and only son? Or is it one of those things where, hmm, yeah, but I don't really want to be committed to that. You see, there's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to living out your life for Jesus. But it is the most rewarding thing in life that you will ever do. I want to end with this. So what attitude did Jesus have? And what would Jesus say to us this morning? What kind of example could he set for us? And I want to invite you to turn to John 13. If you're following in the app, the scripture's right there for you. But if you're in Luke 10, it's the next book over John John 13 begins one of my favorite four chapters in the Bible, the upper room discord the night before Jesus died. He's with his disciples in the upper room. They're about to take Passover. And Jesus does something here, and he says something here that I feel like just cuts to the heart of the issue. Let's read 13, verse 3. John 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. It was the last supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, we hear this, and it's hard to understand sometimes, so, so let me just give you a, a little bit of understanding here. When Jesus is doing this, and he's washing the disciples' feet, there's an actual purpose for this. Usually, the servant in the house, the lowest servant of all, would wash the guest's feet, and there's a reason for it. There's a sanitary reason. The way that they ate and reclined at tables back then is they didn't have chairs. They had pillows on the floor, and literally what they would do is they'd kind of lay on their hip, lay on their side, and they'd kind of lean on one, one elbow, 
elbow and eat with the other hand. And so their feet were like right there next to their buddy, right? And as you go around the table, this guy's feet next to him. And they didn't have shoes back then. They didn't have, you know, close toe to anything. If they had any kind of uh, soles on their feet, they were open-toed sandals. And so the dusty roads around that region, feet were dirty, and so it was actually a sanitary thing. It's like, it'd be nice to have some clean feet here instead of these dirty ones. They're getting dirt all over the pillows. And, and so there's a reason for this. And evidently, Jesus, in his preparation for the Last Supper, had come up and said, you know what? Dismiss the servants for the night. We don't need them. Because I'm going to serve. And taking a towel, he tied it around his waist and he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, one of his disciples, who said to him, Lord, it means master, boss. Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my, you'll never humble yourself as the son of God, as my master, as my Lord, you're going to wash my, you, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him this, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. You have no part of me. Now go down to verse 12. Jesus washes Simon Peter and all the disciples' feet. He says, when he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments and resumed his place at the table, he said to them this, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher, rabbi, one who's in an elevated position. And you call me Lord, master, boss, ruler of your life. And you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you as an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You see, a lot of times for us, verse 17, the last verse there, we, we just want the first part, right? If you know these things, blessed are you. Oh, I know these things. No, Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. And yet it seems like the devil is always still at work. I think it's the Trojan horse that's maybe in the church and killing the church that we, we don't maybe even realize or don't acknowledge sometimes. Is the fact that, that God has called us. He's given us, given us his strength. He's given us his power. He's called us to serve in ministry. And yet we do not answer that call. And let me get really real for a moment here this morning. Some of you, it's because you don't feel qualified. The devil wants to make sure you don't feel qualified, you don't feel good enough. When you go out there and you look at the Say Yes cards and you see that one, you're like, man, I would love to teach kids, but I don't know if I know enough about the Bible. I don't know if I pray well enough. I don't know if you would come with all these excuses. And yet God is saying, say yes and go on an adventure with me and, and just serve. Just do it out of a heart of love for me and my, and my ministry. And whatever area it is that you feel a little stretched, that's good. Because when you are weak, I am strong and I'm going to fill in all the gaps for you. There's so many people that's, that, that feel like they're just inadequate. I don't have the strengths and I don't have the abilities and I don't have all this stuff. And we, we had, we had a, just a time of communion backstage before first service this morning with the worship team. And somebody on the worship team was just sharing, I feel inadequate. I mean, through tears. I feel inadequate to be here. I feel inadequate in another ministry I do in the church. I just never feel like good enough. It's like, that's the devil. You're not good enough. You're not qualified enough. And yet Jesus says, say yes. Say yes. 
give you everything you need. Just say yes to me. And in this scripture and in this passage, it's so interesting because it feels like at this point, the Samaritan is the religious person, right? The Samaritan is the leader. The Samaritan said this. This is a prayer you could pray. Jesus, I'll do what I can do and I'll let you do what only you can do. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Jesus, I'm going to do what I can do and what I'm called to do. And I'll let you do whatever only you can do. Because we have to acknowledge it's God's power. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And I was thinking, how, 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 do, you, how do you illustrate this? How can you even think of this? And the best, best way I know is, is, you remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? You know that story from, from the scripture? It was 5,000 men later in the scripture. It tells you it was just the men that were being counted. It wasn't the women and children. Most scholars believe he fed somewhere between 20 and 25,000 people at that meal. But go with me for a second. Uh, Jesus has been teaching all day, and the disciples say, hey, we need to let these people go home. These people need to go home because they're hungry, and we need to let them go home. Jesus says, oh, no, no, wait, I've got a little bit more to say, and let's just take care of their needs right now. How are we going to feed all these people? We have no food. And then there's a boy, and he says, hey, got five loaves and two fish. And a loaf back then wasn't like a loaf. It was like a little, little thing. Five loaves, two fish. The disciples are rolling their eyes by this point. I was like, seriously, come on. Five loaves and two fish. That, that's not going to feed four people. I mean, and Jesus says, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's enough. And Scripture says that he broke it and he blessed it and they began to pass it around and it fed 20,000 people. And then they took up baskets of leftovers that fed even more people. You see, that's what God is calling you to say yes to. To just say, you know what, I don't have much, but I got, I got some loaves and fish. And Jesus says, bring it on, that's all I need. That's all I need, just bring, bring me what you got. It doesn't seem like very much, God. Yeah, it's okay, bring it. Just offer it to me, just give it to me. Five loaves, two fish. Five loaves, two fish of your time. Five loaves, two fish of your ability. Five loaves, two fish of your testimony, of your witness, of what you do know about the Bible and not what you don't. Five loaves, two fish. And you watch what God can do. When someone who loves God and loves the gospel begins to serve because serving is love's response. Let's pray. God, as we come into this time of invitation this morning, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that we may be feeling in our hearts right now. And God, I just pray that as we sing this song, as we know that this, this decision room is available over to our right, and there's going to be people there to pray with us and talk to us about our next step to, to following your son. Lord, just do your work in our hearts right now. Continue to, to operate in our minds, God. And, and give us your encouragement, Lord. Give us your conviction, Lord, that we are to say yes to you. That we are to say yes to you, God. That we are to say yes to the gospel. And by doing so, we show that we're going to give a response because we do love you. We do love your mission. We do love your church. We do love these people. And because of that, we will serve. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.